John Evelyn would have approved of my speaking to you from 3,500 miles away. Evelyn's hospitality of mind made him assimilate new ideas, as Francis Harris and Michael Hunter point out. While Jan and I have more recently drawn attention to Evelyn's faith in new technologies, that of the greenhouse, for example, I'll leave it to Jan to speak on planting ideals at Sayers Court, ideals derived from the ancients as well as the moderns. My subject today is redemption. First, Evelyn's Elysium as a redemptive restoration or revival, renewal, restitution, instauration, as Graham Parry defines it in a millennial sense. And second, our belief in garden restoration as remaking that which is lost as heritage, both before and after our own millennium, the year 2000. Situated on the Thames in Deptford, close to industry and the naval dockyards, Sayers Court was scarcely a promising place to establish a terrestrial Elysium. Yet Evelyn invoked the entire mystery of gardening, from the preparation of soil to the recreation of paradise on earth, to ground his villa life there from 1653 to 1694. In the golden age of scholarly restoration, the 1980s and 1990s, I believed in the possibility of recreating on paper and on the ground a lost original. My drawings of parterre, shown here, and grove reflect a representational confidence. Conjectural reconstructions of 1993 to 98. By 1997, however, at the ICOMOS International Conference in Bamberg, Germany, I had already addressed during the 10th anniversary of the Great Storm of 1987, the topic of climate, weather, and planting design in English formal gardens. By 2005, at ICOMOS Canada in Toronto, I returned to this theme under the title, The Impact of Climate Change on Historic Landscapes. What I wrote for the British Library Conference of 2001 and the tercentennial publications of 2006-07 were shaped by the work on the ground, notably at Paynes Hill, where we'd endured droughts as well as hurricanes. My new book, A Natural History of English Gardening, 1650 to 1800, will set out the environmental evidence that complements what I reconstructed in the flowering of the landscape garden. So let me briefly preview today what is in chapter one on Evelyn and Sayers Court, which begins with this reconstruction of the 1653 Grove and the 1653 Parterre. Francis Harris's discovery, while the Evelyn archive was catalogued at the British Library, of Evelyn Sayers Court redesign of February 1685 which I'm showing you here, provides a point of departure for the chapter. In the wake of a devastating winter, he devised a replanting of the area formerly occupied by that oval parterre, his so-called Morin garden, and part of his orchard. This plan helps to show how the garden evolved from inception in the 1650s to the layout surveyed on two plans of the 1690s which I'm showing you here. Evelyn's radical revision of the garden came in his mid-sixties and during the low ebb in family fortunes. After the loss of a daughter to smallpox and just before a second would succumb to the disease in July 1685, a long-suffering Mary Evelyn wrote to a friend, Mr. Evelyn makes the garden his business and delight. It now grows towards finishing and does answer expectation very well, being finer than ever. For the future, I hope it will be less expensive. The chapter unfolds as an exploration of environmental instability, something we don't normally associate with Baroque formality. 
On the one hand, the garden in the span 1653-1694 was at the mercy of the extremes of the Little Ice Age. On the other, gardening was regularly and inescapably prone to the depredations of insect, bird, mole, and vermin. The shift away from parterre to grass and fruit in the wake of that bitter winter, though it brought the economy Mary wanted, did not liberate the gardener, Jonathan Moss, from exterminating birds, even birds that Evelyn called angelic winged choristers. And in his tools, he shows the various devices for trapping vermin and birds. Doubtless Moss knew which of the spontaneous visitors to feed in the winter along with exotic birds and pets. However, when it came down to it, he must have resorted to many cruel practices to protect the winter fruit for the table. Evelyn's innocent diet of salads set out in Aceteria could not preclude the killing of animals. In Aceteria, A Discourse of Salads, 1699, the arguments are not solely concerned with the merits of what he called the herby diet, which included, of course, more fruit. Evelyn also discussed what makes for good food, clean soil and clean air, and dealing with what he called ordure. In that sense, along with his pioneering work of environmental remediation, fumifugium, and his attempts to rid the greenhouse of vitiated air, Evelyn looked forward as well as back in shaping his restorative concept of Elysium. Purity lay at the root of everything, including the greenhouse. Getting pure air back into the structure was key. As Evelyn put it in the opening pages of the Elysium Britannicum, so that to define a garden now is to pronounce it inter solatia humana purissimum, a place of all terrestrial enjoyments, the most resembling heaven, and the best representation of our lost felicity. It is the common term and the pit from whence we were dug. We all came out of this parsley bed. His overarching concern with purity, whether in the artificial climate of the greenhouse or the wider atmosphere of city and country, whether of air and soil or of body and soul, makes Evelyn a luminary in policy as much as in technology. This view above Greenwich, showing Deptford, also shows a smoky CO2 London of the time. And that is where we should turn to the present on a point about climate change and CO2. In the Proceedings of the Painsville Conference of 2010, Brent Elliott writes, Comparison with Evelyn shows that some of the plants were, at the time of Miller's first edition of the Gardener's Dictionary, 1731, already flowering at an earlier time than in the late 17th century. 19th century sources, on the other hand, show that these plants fairly consistently were falling back to a later flowering time by the 1830s, and it's only in the second half of the 20th century that flowering times return to those recorded in the third quarter of the 18th century. What that means for Paynes Hill is remarkable, because our experiment in restoring the planting of Charles Hamilton's own Elysium was blessed by a chance correspondence between the 30 years 1981 to 2011 on the one hand and the gap of 36 years on the other from the freezing of the Thames in 1740 to the deep freeze of 1776, those years that I call the cornucopia years of Thomas Robbins' beautiful drawings. Two isolated winters are quite unlike the succession of six frost fairs in the second half of the 17th century during Evelyn's period. In short, the golden age of planting reconstruction of Paynes Hill is now well and truly over, though architectural reconstruction continues, and of course, new planting at Strawberry Hill reminds us that we can still try new ventures. We're in the second decade of the 21st century and a freak winter taking place both in North America and in parts of Europe presages a new normal. We have to adapt very fast, planting at Paynes Hill will not lose its authenticity, of course, but it must be modified to allow for maximum resilience in the face of extremes of climate change and other contingencies. 
for example, that of volcanic activity. Think of Iceland, 2010, but more severe as in 1783. Such extreme variability puts a premium on flexibility. For example, the display garden at Paynes Hill already allows for a virtual reconstruction of 18th century planting processes protected from any outrageous occurrences by flexible control of water, microclimate, and soils. Now, what this means for Say's Court, I believe, is latitude to think outside conventional restoration. Aside from climate change, any restoration is compromised by the current condition, the high level of conjecture, and indeed the new context of the Deptford setting. Above all, the full scope of Evelyn's hospitality of mind encompass more than the creation of a single ideal garden and a compendium of horticultural knowledge, the Elysium Britannicum. From his tentative commitment to a history of trades, which perhaps involved too much intercourse with artisans and mechanics for his liking, as Perry puts it, to his consequential commitment to environment, tree planting, food in the city and green belt, technology, public service and health, hospitals and war relief, the arts and sciences, music and dance, erudite education, his legacy is surely best served in making Sayers Court something of a policy center for remediating ills of our time, something of an antidote. Evelyn's capacity to find the redemptive in the worst of personal and public circumstances remained to the very end at Wootton, Surrey, even through the great storm of 1703. Despite the dismal groans of our forests and despite the self-castigating acceptance of a judgment of national and personal sins, he ended his 1706 edition of Silver on an ascendant note. I shall, if God protract my years and continue health, be continually planting till it please him to transplant me into the glorious regions above the celestial paradise, planted with perennial groves and trees bearing immortal fruit. If we doubt the relevance of his millenarian faith, the return of a terrestrial paradise, and if, despite making gardens and groves, we cannot converse with good angels, as Evelyn hoped, we might pause to consider modern ideas derived from his work, for example, for the sick and wounded at Chatham and Greenwich, as discussed by Gillian, an alleviation of the impacts of violence. Stephen Pinker, for example, in The Better Angels of Our Nature, argues on the decline of violence and on the rights revolution underway above all for animals as well as for women and gays and minorities. Some have questioned his over-optimistic reading of data, but a modern version of Evelyn's Baconian community or college offering prospect of hope in our dismal times is surely a way of honoring Evelyn's redemptive ideal at Sayers Court. Training gardeners to contend with climate change, just as Evelyn used hygroscope and weather glass in his Little Ice Age era, might be, for example, Course 101 in a new curriculum predicated upon a more hospitable understanding of the human-animal bond. That curriculum would, of course, amount to an updating of Elysium Britannicum along with Evelyn's collective works from Fumifugium to Assoteria. Indeed, combining policy center with educational college, a Sayers Court Institute, so-called, might translate into a radical think tank for contemporary landscape studies. Thank you. <laughs>